Our next panel is titled Tech for Scale Up. Um, I'm excited to um, introduce this panel to you. There by Anna D'Alessio. Um, I'll leave it to the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, there's Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi. Hi. We're excited to have you. So um, I'll just let the rest of you get up here. We'll make sure that everybody gets on. Um, let's see. Hi, Adiola. Hi, I'm Addie, actually. Hi, Addie. I'm with Addie this week. <laughs> All right, is that everyone? There's one I more. Think one, more. So one more. Kirby, right? Yep, there's Kirby. Awesome. All right, I'll leave it to you guys, you ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're excited to have this great set of panelists today to talk about tech for scale up. Um, and just along the way, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the Q and A and we'll try and get to them um, before the end of the session. So um, I think we should just start with some introductions. Um, like Amy said, my name is Anna D'Alessio. Um, I work for Evaldi Group, which is a startup based in California, helping companies shift to digital distribution and using additive manufacturing to produce parts on demand. Um, and so I'll be moderating this panel today and I'm gonna ask all the panelists just to introduce yourself. Um, so Addy, do you wanna start? Yep, hi, I'm Addy Oluwamiji. I am the Director of Additive Manufacturing Solutions at Desktop Metal. My area of expertise at Desktop Metal is uh, binder jetting, pretty much industrialization and scaling up of uh, binder jetting. Thank you. Uh, Becca, you want to next? Sure. Uh, I'm Becca Crabb. I'm a software engineer and manager on the software team at Carbon. Um, I'm currently working on our design engine product, um, which helps users create lattices um, and design lattices for products. Thanks. Gabrielle? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabrielle Phelan. Um, a little bit about myself. My degree is in mechanical engineering. I work for and Topology, which is a software company based in New York City. Yan? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Yan. I'm working for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So we are developing, actually we are say, developing measurement science for additive manufacturing. My specific area are a additive manufacturing data management, data analytics to accelerate uh, AM uh, adoption and uh, you know, deployment. And Kirby? Great. I'm Kirby Freeman. I work at Carbon. I've been at Carbon about six years working as a product manager for the software team. I work really closely with Becca. And uh, we announced in the last year that we are uh, helping folks design parts with our design engine product that does uh, latticing and um, has the start of the metamaterials library. Great. Thank you. Um, so to start out, my first question is, when preparing for scale up, what does readiness look like? What does that process look like? Um, Addy, do you want to start? Um, I believe when we're talking about uh, readiness for scaling up, most people just usually think I'll buy more machines and maybe I have one machine before, then I'll make it two or I'll buy a bigger machine. And but when you're doing readiness, especially when you're trying to scale up, there's so many different processes that you have to think about. And uh, before you are ready for scaling up, you have to have developed that technology to some extent. So you have to have something in place for developing a product. At that point, you must have taken that product from design stage to actually qualifying the product. And now you can scale it. That is one piece. There are other pieces that involve such as workforce planning. If you're trying to scale up, maybe you had one machine, now you want to scale up to 10. You have to think about how many new employees do I need? At this point, when I'm done with my development, should I be hiring more technicians and operators instead of hiring more scientists? Because the scientists are probably required for more the development case. So should I be phasing them out into other projects? There are other things that are such as quality that is very paramount. You want to make sure that when you're scaling up, you have to make sure every product that comes out of your line 
what are you going to use to make sure that the products are actually the same quality over and over again? So quality is very critical. Apart from that, you want to scale up? Are you ready when it comes to facility preparation? Are you going to buy a new facility? Are you going to scale up that facility? There is a lot that has to do with facility planning. Now you have to think about waste disposal. In our case, for my journey, um, you may have scrap parts, uh, green, green state. You have to think about the legislation for your state. So many things have to be done when you're thinking about scaling up. My point here is scaling up is beyond, I want more machines. Scaling up involves many processes and you, can, you have to sit down with your team to plan the capital for scaling up. And usually it's beyond just the machine. You have to think about this type of software. For example, ordering software. Maybe before, when you're developing, you're not placing any order. You didn't have an ERP, CRM, or MES system. All of this has to come to play for you to actually be ready to scale up the manufacturing process. And um, I feel like for me, pretty much, it's a solution, right? It's not just about a machine. There are processes. There is so many things involved apart from the machine. So you have to always take your plan and scale up for it to be successful uh, the way you want it. Great. Thanks. Um, so you ask, thing, I think yeah. um, a good example of way to look at if you're thinking about scaling up additive is probably start with an MRL matrix out there. We have manufacturing readiness plan and this is available um, maybe on the NASA website, DOD website, where you can at least have a template, be able to look at some of the processes they're recommending that you think about before scale up. That could be a good starting point. If internally additive is pretty new to you guys, it could serve as a blueprint you can adopt to a process. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, and do you feel that the standards and regulations that are in place and being developed right now are helpful or are ready to help us with basically um, what Addy was just talking about in terms of scaling up? Yeah, I just want to about say that I'm not an industry stakeholders in the AM community representing the standards community. I did find the demands for standards uh, by working with other industry uh, partners. So for example, on the ASTM, it, um, F42, so that's for the uh, additive manufacturing. More and more demands for the standards indicates. Uh, so I think uh, the scaling up that transformation is happening, especially uh, including small and medium business. And uh, from another side, I will say it's more specific to my own domain. More and pe more people are interested in integration. So I think it's a good signal to see that. So AM, you know from the standalone system, from a prototyping tool, so moving up to the production industrializing. And I think some of you probably are familiar a little bit with the, the typical manufacturing automation and management software, for example, MES software. So it has been uh, applied in the traditional manufacturing for years, right? So at the very beginning, we see the focus of the tools on the design and also specific testing. Now we can see that there's more and more MES software for AM. So it's kind of emerging. At the same time, we see the other uh, big competitive uh, companies like uh, Siemens, uh, like uh, PTC, they are starting to incorporate modules of AM design or AM specific you know, analysis into their product offering. So that's what I feel, you know, it's a right moment to see, uh, you know, the scaling this transformation is really ongoing, but it, standards is kind of always behind technology. So we are catching up, especially on F42, we have a, a faster balloting process, actually try to, to prepare the enabling standards for the um, maturity of the technology and adoption for production. Great, thank you. Um, so how is software helping to enable customers to be able to design for additive manufacturing so that we can see these parts being used in production? Um, Becca, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, so I think software can be, can be used in the whole process of this um, of additive manufacturing, starting with early design. And then um, I think 
Addy and Jan both mentioned, I think Addy mentioned ordering parts is another piece of software in this ecosystem, and Jan mentioned MES, um, kind of quality tracking on the backside. Um, so there's a whole wide range in how software can help move this industry forward and help um, scale it up, if you will. Um, some things to highlight on the design front um, are things like um, helping, helping users design uh, features that can only be made in additive manufacturing, right? So things that can't be injection molded, but play to the strengths of additive manufacturing, having software help, help users automatically add those things into their parts. Um, another one is, is latticing parts. So as Kirby and I mentioned, we work on software that helps users lattice their parts. And this is another kind of superpower of additive manufacturing um, that can help um, help designers meet certain performance specs or maybe even improve on existing performance specs of a material such as foam by using kind of a meta material um, additive manufacturing lattice. Um, and then kind of on the automation and manufacturing side, um, there's things software can do such as you know, automatically adding serial numbers to the digital models as they get printed um, for kind of connecting this digital thread and, and seeing um, you know, which printer made which parts and which factory at what time. Um, and things like APIs. So we have an API that um, is being used right now in the thermoforming industry um, to help customers automate more of these things and really scale up and increase the throughput of the number of parts they can produce. So um, automating the packing the parts onto a build and queuing the builds to printers and running an efficient factory um, and then through the use of automation is another way that software can really help scale things up. Great. So speaking about software, um, Gabrielle, how have you, uh, do you have any examples of how you've seen customers and other organizations use, utilize, and topology software in order to help with scale up? Yeah, that was a great segue, Becca, into my side of things, software. Um, if you've ever heard of Entopology, you may have been like many others who first come across us and think that we're just a cool lattice tool which we are, don't get me wrong, the speed and scale and complexity of what we can achieve is truly unmatched due to how we represent geometry. But we go far beyond just latticing and topology is a tool that looks to remove bottlenecks in your design tasks, tackle your engineering problems and ultimately streamline processes. I think a really great example of where I've seen this actually in industry is um, our work with Lightforce Orthodontics. So, Lightforce is a company that offers an online portal where orthodontists can upload 3D scans of patients' mouths and determine the position of each individual bracket of a wire brace. And by shifting from legacy software to end topology, the engineers at Lightforce reduce their design time, I believe from 10 hours to three hours. And to bring this design time down even further, they leverage end topology's ability to interact with the command line, and now they can execute this entire design process for each brace programmatically using scripts, and they've brought down this design time down to 10 minutes. So this is one of many examples of how we've removed bottlenecks and have automated processes. We ultimately remove the time spent on tedious and manual operations and allow engineers to really better spend that time um, dedicated to innovating and ultimately scaling up your organization within the industry. That's pretty cool. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a huge change, and especially when uh, lead time is a big issue to be able to reduce that design time and make this part so quickly is pretty awesome to hear. Um, so uh, Kirby, you've been working at Carbon for a couple years now, and I'm curious if you've noticed any th major changes over the last few years um, that you find encouraging in terms of leaning towards scale up, whether that's within Carbon or just within the industry in general. Great. Well, I'm going to let everyone hear in on a secret. Um, you're only going to hear it on this panel. Uh, we've been in a global pandemic um, in the last and uh, well, that's had lots of negative impacts. I think for additive, it's made conversations about using and scaling up additive very real. And um, I think we've, all of our companies are feeling this impact. Um, I'll talk in, uh, about an example at Carbon, um, working with Resolution Medical. Um, 
really to you know, the power of additive to move quickly, to make better performing parts, and to have a much more nimble supply chain. So this is a class one medical device, uh, nasal pharyngeal swab. Um, before the pandemic, um, no one was imagining using additive or lattices um, to make these swabs. And in the course of 30 days, um, we were able to do a number of design iterations and a clinical trial with major medical institutions like Beth Ezreal and uh, Stanford and uh, get approval for this swab. Um, so really the design um, process and the validation process moved incredibly quickly. Um, and then in this process, that swab was better performing than anything existing. So faster cycle, better part, and then a much more nimble supply chain. Um, so there were factories that were not getting orders the month before were not producing swabs and were able to scale up to making millions of units. Um, so global pandemic wouldn't have chosen one, um, but pretty exciting about the conversations and the real production use cases that are um, coming out of that. Yeah, for sure. It's been really great to see the additive manufacturing community sort of step over, up over the past almost two years now during this pandemic and try and help with new solutions. So that's really great to hear. Um, so what uh, industry or application of additive manufacturing technology do you think has the best potential for scaling up both from a technical feasibility perspective as well as cost effectiveness? I'll start with Yan. You're muted. <laughs> so, I work. I'm working with the in the standards community. Also, the most I'm working with are from aerospace, and uh, but the conference I attended are okay, to um, like automotive medical sector. So, through my own. I kind of yeah, because this this three industries are, are quite different uh, of adopting uh, AM. So I think for the aerospace, that's the spare part issue. A lot of you know repairing stuff, and for medical, that's to support the personalization. That's a major thing, as uh, Kirby mentioned. And for automotive, that's the pursuing the performance, like by lightweight, and also consolidate the parts to you know instead of assemblies. Um, I th these are the three industry I kind of familiar, and I and also observe like combinations of like uh, jewelry industry and uh, uh, you know clothes or uh, fashion industry. So they they are kind of m m might not be the high performed like a metal based uh, the powder bag fusion based process. So in instead maybe polymer or you know some other process more cost effective. Uh, less, you know, tolerance requirements. So that's just, uh, I, I'm not the first hand, you know, industry participant. So I would like to hear more from other panelists. Does anyone else have other thoughts on it's ready? Go ahead, ready? Yeah, I have a few thoughts. So when we're thinking about technology that has visibility for scaling up, um, in the past, I had worked on polymer. So DLP for polymer is a very good one because of the ability to mass produce. And uh, for metal, vinyl jetting today is leading. And it's because of its ability to mass produce, really. Uh, but I also see laser powder fusion, depending on your industry, what type of uh, pad quality uh, do you desire? What's the criticality of that part? You know, Where does it belong in your engine? All of that, the technical requirements should drive what technology you should focus on. So binary jetting may be like high throughput. The question is, does this serve your part accordingly? But if you have parts that fits into binary jetting, I think it's property, allow it to be high throughput. And there's some other good qualities that you can get out of binary jetting, such as we don't have support structures that are attached to the build plate. So you can stack up a lot of parts within one build bed and which could drastically reduce your cost. And when talking about cost, not only the stacking up will help you reduce cost. For vinyl jetting in our case at desktop metal, we use mint powder 
And MIM powder is already available today. The supply chain is wide because MIM is existing and the cost of the powder is drastically low. So that means the cost of your part can be really low. For example, I used to work in automotive. So cost of part in automotive are usually very cheap and the, part, the parts are usually large scale. So you, you need hundreds of thousands. So it could be ideal for automotive suppliers to look at buying a jetting because it can mass produce, can do high throughput, and the cost can be really reasonable. As, and when we're talking about the materials, you can get that cheaply because you can, you can get tons of it because they're already available. Now, there are other qualities that I think makes binder jetting really, really good. Uh, one of them, apart from design flexibility with, that everybody has, is the isotropic property that you get. So compared to laser powder diffusion, that isotropic property could enhance uh, your mechanical property that's critical. In addition to that, we don't use any sort of laser that could de de degrade the powder. So our powder are usually 100% recycled, so you can keep recycling it forever, which means that also will help you manage costs to a large extent. Some of this quality makes Vinogenin very attractive if you're looking for high throughput, if you're looking for low cost, uh, it could be the right technology for you. If you're actually thinking about complexity as well, because we don't have support structures that kind of could get into a hole and will be had to review that to remove that may be a good one for you when you have very complex shapes so it could be good it has its bottlenecks a little bit here and there but when we look at the gain uh you get from it it supersedes the bottleneck every every technology do have one so i'm, I'm voting for binder jetting for metal additive when it comes to really scaling up but for us at that's not metal uh, scaling up, we we understand scaling up to one company could mean 10,000 parts. To another company could mean 100,000 or, or 1 million parts. So we have a wide range of uh, additive machines that can cater to whatever scaling up means to you. If you have part range, we have machines for that. If you have millions of parts per year, we have machines for that. And usually support you with hand-to-hand uh, -hand solution. So we don't just sell you the part. We, we support you with our expertise, so you're able to develop and scale over time, pretty much. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other thoughts on that? On the polymer side or design? No. OK. Um, what are some examples of products that you've seen that have been better than existing products because they were specifically designed for additive manufacturing? Um, how about we start with Becca on this one? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I bet Gabby could, could join in here too, but I, I'll start it off with, um, so uh, again, one of additive's superpowers um, is the ability to, com to make complex geometries that aren't possible to injection mold or possibly not possible to make with any other technology. And we can take advantage of that new freedom in design to innovate and improve on um, existing products. Um, and so uh, I'll use the lattice example again here. So um, we partnered with Specialized, um, which is a bike, bicycle cycling company. Um, and they've made a couple saddles using um, lattice structures using our technology. Um, and one is called the Roman Evo saddle. Um, and uh, the focus on this saddle was um, on the damping and energy recovery um, characteristics to protect um, blood flow and relieve pain when sitting on the saddle. Um, and we use lattices to create kind of a multi-zone lattice. So um, we have different performance characteristics right around the sit bone um, than other parts of the saddle. Um, and using that kind of um, control that lattices and these complex geometries give you on the performance of the part, we were able to redu reduce the peak pressure um, up to 26% on the sit bones compared to foam. Um, so I don't know if you've been on a long bike ride, but um, there's nothing worse than an uncomfortable bike saddle. Um, and another, another good example that's kind of in a similar space there with, with lattices is uh, our partnership with Rydell. Um, so again, we used uh, software to help design these lattices um, to design a directional lattice that um, has better impact absorption um, when football helmets head to head collisions um, and these helmets performed better than um, previous helmets on the market. Um, so those are just a couple of examples, but uh, I think there's a lot when you look at the at what new design freedoms additive manufacturing allows you to explore. Awesome. 
Gabrielle, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think, again, this ties into something that we talk a lot about at Entopology, um, field-driven design. So there's really these three pillars that we talk about here that set us apart from other tools on the out there. It's uh, the way we represent geometry, implicit model, repeatable, reusable workflows, which I kind of talked to earlier, um, but then field-driven design. So this is kind of the aspect that takes a little time for people to wrap their head around, but once we get it in your heads and you start getting the wheels turning, it's opens the door to great complexity. So give you a little rundown of what exactly field-driven design allows us to do and how I've been seeing an in industry is um, basically field-driven design is a design methodology that enables engineers or designers to leverage valuable data within an organization and incorporate it, incorporate it into a part. Simply put, fields allow the designer to have complete control over that geometry in extremely in intricate ways in order to fine tune their design to get closer to that optimized part. So examples of this that Beck actually was talking to are like, maybe we're looking at a helmet and looking at an impacts, or maybe we have a heat exchanger on a helicopter and we want to run a thermal analysis and we're seeing areas where we need to dissipate heat more. So maybe in that case, I want to increase the periodicity of a gyroid lattice based on where I'm seeing hot spots. Or maybe I'm designing patient specific shoe soles and I'm taking pressure maps from different people and I'm saying, okay, in higher pressure, I'd probably want more support. So let's do that. Let's find to the, the lattice to create a more stiff um, response due to high pressure. Or maybe in low pressure, let's have a more cushioning effect. So using field driven design, we're able to architect the material and in, um, really fine tune it to optimize its performance. So ultimately we can collect all this important data that we capture within the engineering design process and unify it into a single high performing part. And I think this speaks to engineering as a whole and how it's always been a very collaborative field. So you have the design side, the material side, simulation, manufacturing, maybe standards. And I, I think the people on this panel with our different expertise and backgrounds is a statement to this. So let's not waste this knowledge and um, this knowledge and expertise and let's synthesize all this valuable data and we can do this with field-driven design. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so as we talked about how, you know, parts are designed for additive manufacturing and this might be very new for companies and users, um, how do you think parts will continue to be qualified over time as we start to scale up? Will it continue to be sort of individually as these parts are looked at as unique parts? Or do you think that we can move towards what we're sort of looking at more traditionally um, based on Six Sigma for mass production? Yan? Yeah, I, I have a quick one. I think it's a uh, challenging. Okay, it depends on the application. So for critical applications, the qualification reliability is uh, challenging because we are talking about uh, 99.9969s, okay, uh, that reliability is needed for to fly apart. But maybe in other, you know, if you just make uh, uh, I can not non-functional parts, so all, you know, in the fashion industry, oh, that might be less uh, critical. That's what I think in that mass production, probably the traditional Six Sigma qualification still works, but still that requires some, you know, standards, a new methodology change and a demonstration or proof. For example, uh, you know, today's, especially for aerospace FAA, right? So guided. So the qualifications are very, very, you know, uh, strict. So NASA has its own qualification uh, standards for for their component and FAA has similar. So you have to qualify material first, then you qualify your process. So you lock your process parameters, then you, you know, you basically you have to qualify a master product, then you can make more copies, right? So basically compare all your copies of data then to the qualified part. So you do one by one, yeah. Uh, this is kind of purely experiments based Okay, for each step, material uh, qualification, process qualification. So now the new way people are talking about called equivalency based or probability based. So that is heavily rely on data. 
Okay, accumulate data from all the life cycles, material, machine development, part development. So part could be from material coupons. And a coupon actually testing doesn't approve, you know, the geometry shape you uh, manufacture. So, but the combination of, of all this data, so which is not original designed to be full factorial. So, but based on machine learning, transfer learning, some advanced, you know, machine learning technology, the hope is, so we can find a process envelope, a process strategy, give us the best possibility to have a qualified part. But still, you know, I would say we can maybe reduce the experiments down to 50%. I still kind of feel people want rely on data or simulation itself to qualify, a, you know, a, a critical applications. Yeah, that's just uh, my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's really interesting to hear what sort of um, tools already exist that we should be relying on in order to qualify those parts versus um, trying to conform into what we're used to doing in some of these industries. But I'm curious to hear um, if you think that it's sort of the same between polymers and metals or if you have sort of different opinions on how that process would look. Um, I don't know if Kirby or Becca, you want to start from the polymer carbon side? Um, yes, certainly on the uh, metal side, not uh, what we're thinking about yet. Um, but I'm excited to be on this panel and see us all in these disciplines. Um, we have at Carbon um, felt the urgency that I see in this panel for um, the innovations possible with additive to get out um, into the world and have more engineers be able to access them. Um, and, you know, we think and have always prioritized um, sort of maybe the foundational part of our um, offerings to uh, create a digital thread. Um, additive really can start um, and be digitally native. Um, and we believe that um, extending that thread, adding to it, um, making it accessible, um, provides such value for designers, for hardware companies, for contract manufacturers, for consumers. Uh, Becca and I were just talking with an internal colleague and um, I loved the way he said that there are, you know, at least four layers of novelty in additive manufacturing and whatever we can do to um, add to the transparency and confidence and control that is possible um, around polymer or metal um, additive manufacturing, the more um, we can uh, let engineers access the technology. So um, we, we believe the digital thread um, and letting uh, all of the different consumers and um, participants in the ecosystem uh, be able to add to it and use it to characterize the results. Um, their additive can be faster. Um, the amount of data can be larger. Um, and, uh, but I think there are so many exciting companies working on um, making sense of that data, feeding it back into the manufacturing process to make better parts. Great. Um, are there any other thoughts from the metal side or even thinking about sort of qualification from the design perspective before you even get to producing a physical part? No, I can add, add a few things there uh, for, for metal right now. I think we, I, I wouldn't say there is a particular software that you can plug in a part that is going to help you with, oh, this is printable or not. Why? Because we have several processes. And what we're seeing today is a lot of attention is being paid to laser power diffusion, right? And so uh, if that is what everybody's place, uh, placing the attention on, there are different feasibility rules for all this different technology. So what will print well on laser power diffusion may not print well on binder jetting. So um, I think there's no software in the market today that can really satisfy everybody. Uh, except if people are building their own internally. Now, I feel like every process deserves a guideline. A design guideline that would help us know that if you redesign this for additive, you introduce this topology, uh, this, uh, you've optimized that geometry. 
is it credible for us? We use centering processes as well. Is it printable? Is it centrable? We have to make sure before we go ahead. Yes, you would have uh, redesigned it. Maybe it looks like this functional improvement, but if you get to that printing process, your part keep breaking because maybe it's too thin or you can't be powder accurately. All of the functional gain that you think you have is not going to come out because you would have no output. So I think right now everything is still majorly um, experience based, I would say, until we get to a point where we the software is able to um, help us decide that all of your optimization will lead to a product that can at the end is printable, is centrable, and when we measure it dimensional wise, everything's going to look good. Um, right now, the type of software we could really count on are the ones that can help you decipher whether you should move on. So it could look at the size of your part and say, this is too big for the platform you've selected, so this can be printed on that platform. Or it could look at some of the features, kind of criticize it and say, this looks too bulky on this side, or this has some type of edges that we don't print, uh, reject, or go modify. But the modification and all of that still have to be done by somebody with a lot of experience. So we don't have software like right now that is smart enough, especially on the MindJet side, that is smart enough to help us take already good designs that have been defamed uh, towards where we're going. Uh, on our side for desktop metal, yes, in the beginning of the process for design, we have design guidelines. So we provide our customers with that. So before you give us any part, please uh, read that document so you have some idea of what we can print and what is feasible at our hands. And when your part comes to us, we evaluate it. And if it meets the criteria, we may move forward or we can come back with some suggestions on what should you change for us to be able to feasibly uh, give you a good product. Now, internally, we have uh, something similar like the Magix that we use for build prep um, called MFG. And we also have, uh, for us, centering is our biggest bottleneck. Is our big, when it comes to uh, whether the, the part will succeed, we can print the part. We can do powder successfully because we have good that grain strength. But can you center it adequately? So we have a software called Life Center, which is still part of design. So before you print it at all, Life Center can run a simulation, a centering simulation to tell you that uh, this part is going to whack. It's going to bend, it's going to distort. If you orientate it this way, maybe you should change it this way, or maybe you should uh, add some uh, meat over here, uh, add some stock over here so that you can uh, improve its um, um, centrability. So we have something to at least help us make sure that if we're going to fail, there is prediction that this particular area is where you could have failure, so you can mitigate that. Uh, on the design side, we're using that a lot, but that, that only happens after we have kind of talk to you, <laughs> let you know that's going to be printable, uh, change it a little bit, and uh, we can provide you that feedback alongside change it here and there for you to know that um, centrability, uh, you have to kind of beef it up in this area or remove some things in that area, or we may change orientation uh, based on what we work on our machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I really like what you said, that it's, it's still a lot um, experience-based that not just anyone can come in, learn how to use software, press a button, and we're going to have repeatable prints across the board. Um, so that's that's good to hear. Um, Gabrielle, think, do you? Oh, go ahead. All right, go, sorry, back up. Uh, I was going to just add on to that. I think um, Addy said something really spot on where about how like every process is different, and so there's no kind of one software that um, designs for all of these things. Um, and so I think Carbon, with our, with the design software that we're building, um, obviously we have the benefit of being very tightly connected to Carbon's printers and our printing platform. And so we can kind of um, focus first on trying to do some of solve these problems that Adi was talking about. You know, identifying areas that might not print well, running simulations, um, optimizing design to be able to print faster, all these kind of things, and can can start with the printing platform that we know best and then um, over time expand to other platforms as those platforms mature and their processes you know are more easily codable for um, and easy to write um, algorithms that that can um, help design for yeah just 
like to piggyback off this because I think this is really, really interesting. Um, again, going off what Addy said, like knowing what your constraints are, I think when I'm training users in entopology or kind of giving demonstrations, um, we can create a, le a lot of really complex geometry, but it's not really great if you actually can't manufacture it or get to the printer. Um, so actually knowing those constraints from there's things that we can bake into the software through like topology optimization. We have like an overhang constraint and you're only going to get a result that complies with that overhang constraint. But if you're doing other latticing operations, um, maybe I'm playing like a bunch of like a stochastic lattice or Voronoi lattice and I have a bunch of beam thicknesses or pore sizes, knowing your constraints. Okay, I can't print below a thickness of so forth and I can't maybe I can't print print above a thickness of so forth, or maybe I have to think about different overhang angles of this lattice. Well, we have filters within our software that um, allow you, the user, if they know those constraints, can filter out those things from the design. So it's not, let's create this geometry and we get a green check and we're gonna go print it and then um, throw it on a helicopter or something. No, there's a lot of more design intuition that goes into it. And again, more collaboration amongst the manufacturing side, the material side and so forth. Um, so it looks like we have one question um, from participants right now. Um, so this is for you, Addy. How are the challenges different between laser powder bed fusion, which is lower volume and more expensive, versus desktop metal, higher volume and cheaper in terms of workflow and process performance? Challenges. All right. Uh, one very obvious challenge uh, that is different a lot is um, where the heat is applied. So for laser power infusion, it's layer by layer, you apply the laser on that surface, and you could have residual stresses, which could lead to cracking or some issues layer by layer. And that also allow you to form anisotropy kind of material properties. On the binder jet side, our heat is applied after printing. So you, the, the printing is using the raster base, uh, you just pour the binder on the powder and it glues it together. So there's no heat applied at all. And you can handle that. But once you take that into the Sintrain um, furnace, where you're supposed to actually now melt a part of it, depending on the process you're using, um, that is where heat is applied for us. And that is where we experience discussion. That, that is where we have tons of issues, cracking and all of that. So those two technologies, the, the point at which it, it is applied really does differentiate them in terms of challenges. Uh, yeah, you, you can deal with that one in the machine, uh, but you can't deal with the other one until you get a centering furnace and test what the situation is. So somebody can tell you and say, hey, it's I throughput. Yes, it's great, but there is still centering constraint. Uh, if you print it properly, you have enough expertise to actually center it properly. Uh, another challenge is uh, support structure. So for Lisa Power Fusion parts, they have support structures attached to the part. And when you're done, you have to find a way to break the support structures. It could be labor intensive. And if you're dealing with a lot of parts, so you need um you need to go through that labor intensive process. For vinyl jetting, it have it has a different type of support structure. So it has um centering setters. You can just remove the setter if it's green setter, or you can just use ceramics, which is reusable. So the, the, the two technologies are so different that what affects them are so they're so different. Now, when it comes to getting 99.99% uh, .99 properties, you can get that on Elizabeth Power Fusion. You may not be able to get that on, on Binder Jetting. So they cater to uh, the same different audience because of the different, I would say, pros and also cons. It's just a little different. Uh, pretty much. Yeah, I volume is, is great, but its own constraint is pretty much a lot of time the bottleneck of centering and uh, laser is just a little different in that case. I hope that helps. Great, thank you. Um, so I see Amy joined back again, I think, because we're about we're running out of time. Yes, thank you all so much for this really awesome panel. I wish we could just go on and on, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, if everyone could uh, join us at the main stage for some final remarks, um, we'll, we'll do that now. And thank you all so much again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us.